A new name for the global custodian audience to remember is Polymath Network, which provides technology to make blockchain and security tokens compatible with regulatory and market needs. Thomas Borrell, Chief Product Officer, explains how the institutional adoption of security tokens requires a purpose-built blockchain and how Polymath has solved the challenges with public infrastructure around compliance, governance and confidentiality. We started our journey as, as Polymath on general purpose blockchains and particularly on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, it's all the research and the engagement that we had with institutions that essentially uh, uh, brought to us that understanding that uh, security token adoption by institutions has five major, uh, major barriers to entry. Uh, governance. Uh, which, is, which has to do with uh, fork resistance, which has to do with making sure that contentious forks cannot happen on the chain. Identity, understanding who all the participants in a transaction all the way to the block producers that will bring that transaction to finality, understanding who they are. Confidentiality, to protect uh, positions, to protect trades. And compliance, and specifically around building a, or, or providing an environment that allows uh, the enforcement of transfer restrictions at scale across a large number of asset holders and a large number of, uh, of, uh, of assets. And the last point being transaction finality itself, uh, which has um, in the financial world very stringent requirements of both what it means from a legal perspective and expectation in terms of timing that we felt needed that uh, that dedicated infrastructure that purpose-built blockchain to address it covers multiple multiple aspects one of the very important ones is about avoiding the introduction of new questions um, and and what i mean by that is with the introduction of new technology there's typically um, new compromises that need to be made and and what we paid a lot of attention to in the building of polymesh was making sure that through the use of a new technology, in that case, uh, blockchain, to automate and simplify capital markets, we would not introduce new questions for the users, new constraints for the users, new processes uh, for the users to get accustomed, accustomed to, but also not introduce new questions for regulators as well that would want to understand, uh, for instance, uh, who is deploying the smart contract and what type of risk is associated with it. Well, how about we don't deploy a smart contract and we do this completely differently? And so it, it was it was very much about uh, avoiding those new questions and providing an infrastructure that would allow the surfacing of that value uh, without uh, highlighting or flagging the complexities of the technology. We talk a lot about the benefits of transparency, but with transparency, there's a certain amount of risk as well. And, and particularly as a large investment bank, for instance, I'm probably not uh, very keen on having everyone understand what my positions are, what my trades are, what my trades have been historically, as they could potentially front run what, what I'm doing. And so uh, having that confidentiality around those positions, having confidentiality around those trades is something that we felt very strongly about. And historically, that confidentiality was addressed, uh, particularly in North America, through the use of omnibus type uh, accounts where essentially transactions would take place, but you would not see the asset move. So you didn't know who held it. You didn't know that it had that it had moved. Um, that is an approach that we've seen um, uh, 
continue, uh, continue to be used on uh, on blockchain, but it's it's one that we believe is sort of eliminating a lot of the benefits and a lot of the value that we can have in terms of automation, in terms of executing corporate actions, for example. And so instead of applying the existing principles, uh, what we looked at was what was the original problem that we were trying to solve? What was the problem that organizations were looking to solve through the use of, of these omnibus accounts and making sure that my trades, my position are private, that if I'm asked to disclose them, I have a vehicle to do this, but they're not out there in the open for everyone to see is, is really what drove that, um, uh, that uh, requirement, that higher requirement of confidentiality. And what we're seeing sort of happening short to medium term uh, has a lot to do with making sure proper KYC and AML principles are applied on all digital assets. And so having this identity built right into the chain address some of the needs for understanding who's the recipient when there's a transfer to an unhosted wallet, which is something that the FATF has been talking about, which is something that FinCEN has been talking about as well. Um, so you, you have that that a greater implementation of uh, KYC and AML, or that mandate to implement KYC and AML. What we see though, or what we foresee happening is with those basic principles in place, like identity, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, 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 positive signs coming from regulators, particularly out of uh, the UK and Europe. Uh, Germany recently uh, passed a law that, that uh, allowed for security tokens to be, uh, uh, to be created and, uh, and transferred. And so uh, we're seeing the, the move towards those digital assets, the move towards security tokens to be rather supported by regulators as long as the basic principles of anti-money laundering, for example, are applied to it. And in terms of uh, what what I see personally coming in the next years, you know, the, there was a, a great quote from uh, Jay Biancamano from uh, uh, from State Street that says that said, um, um, you know, he was asked a lot about digital asset, and he said for him it was going to be trickle, 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 and then there would be a flood. And what we're seeing right now is we've seen that trickling happening in 2019, 2020, and, and this year, 2021, with the European Bank of Investment uh, recently issuing a 100 million, million euro bond with uh, uh, Societe Generale, with Goldman Sachs, and with Banco Santander. Um, and so in the coming years, uh, my personal opinion is that we're going to see more new assets uh, come to light uh, within the institutional space and particularly new assets that will allow uh, asset managers to diversify their clients portfolio so it's not going to be about tokenizing assets that are already available on public markets public companies for example those rails are there they're very efficient they can handle trillions of dollars um, on an annual basis and that's that's demonstrated but it's going to be about those new assets that were either too small individually for large investors to be interested in or too big for smaller in in investors to be able to access them bringing those new assets bringing tools around those new assets to enable borrowing to enable lending around the, that uh, global digital marketplace if you will uh, which will then create that sort of parallel market that complements uh, the existing capital markets augments the existing capital markets with uh, the use of digital assets.